Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This is Jason. For the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about asset allocation models. This is a question that I frequently get uh, when we talk about where a particular asset fits in a uh, particular client's portfolio. The answer is not always necessarily obvious, although there are sometimes when it um, should be. There are two traditional asset allocation, sorry, two asset allocation models. One is the traditional model, the sort of rules-based model. I'll cover this in a few moments. And the other that is really the focus of this presentation is the principles-based or contemporary asset allocation model. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to assume that we're working in a three asset class model, just a nice simple cash fixed income equity asset class model. I know a lot of people will use a seven asset class model today and that's fine. This material works absolutely well in a seven asset class model where you might be breaking down your fixed income and equities further into their geographic components. No worries if you're using that or some other model, this material should still be relevant and valid. The traditional model has been a rules-based asset allocation model, and this really comes out of how the Canadian Securities course used to present this material, although you won't find this in current iterations of the Canadian Securities course. But the traditional model here was basically that you could just memorize a list where you would say, all right, everything that kind of looks like cash, bank accounts, money market, uh, GICs maturing in a year or less, would fit into that cash asset class. Fixed income would be bonds, debentures, preferred shares. Again, relatively simple. And equity would comprise common shares. And this works reasonably well if you're dealing with just ordinary investments where there's no sort of tweaks to those characters. But we know that the investment world has gotten quite a bit more complicated that there are a lot of variations on these traditional investments. This is what leads us to a more complicated principles-based model, but one that really does rely on the planner or advisor to actually step in and say, look, in this particular circumstance, this asset fills this role. This leans then on that planner or advisor's uh, capability to actually make a linkage between how will that investment behave and what role does it fill in the client's portfolio. I've laid out some typical principles here that you might apply. And I would suggest if this is something you do regularly in your business, that you take some time to think about this. You might even come up with a policy or procedure to hammer this out. There are cases where um, investment advisors actually have gotten themselves into trouble where they didn't have a good set of rules for their asset allocation or a good set of principles, I should say, for their asset allocation. Cash then is typically not going to keep value in relation to inflation. It's generally losing out relative to inflation. It generally doesn't provide much in the way of income, maybe a little bit of interest on a savings account, but that's typically the extent of it. It's generally very liquid, very accessible, and other than that inflation risk, there's really no meaningful risk to principal. You shouldn't see any sort of default risk around cash type investments. Fixed income then would be a little bit less liquid than cash, although some fixed income instruments are quite liquid it would provide or may provide regular income, although not all fixed income investments do, despite the name. The principle here would be stable. You shouldn't see much volatility around the principle. You'd find default risk would generally be your biggest concern here, although inflation is also a concern. And what would happen here is as inflation and interest rates move, you should see returns and values move also relative to moves in inflation and interest rates, and generally not terribly tax efficient investments on the fixed income side. On the equity side, we should see then volatile market values, 
and those values would be linked to supply and demand. Equity should beat inflation over the long term, and the biggest risk we're generally concerned with here is business risk. If you are concerned that this investment might fluctuate because of the performance of some underlying business, then it's probably equity. How might we apply this then? Well, traditionally any GIC would normally be categorized as cash or it might be based on term to maturity as I described before. But I wanna show here that by applying a principles-based model, we can actually potentially see a GIC fit into any of the three asset classes. So in my first bullet point here, if you've got a redeemable to your GIC where the investor is holding it in retirement really to provide that pool of cash to make sure that they're insulated from having to dip into their other investments to provide their necessary source of cash, then I would argue that that asset class probably is best represented as cash. Whereas if you have an investor who's using a GIC ladder where they just keep rolling money from one GIC to the next and they're constantly cycling through GICs with terms to maturity from one to five years, this is generally more about asset preservation than anything else. You might roughly match inflation here. I would suggest that this in a certain circumstance might fit better into the fixed income category. And finally, you might have an investor where they want to get market returns without having any sort of um, risk to their principal and that investor might use a market linked GIC and I would suggest that market linked GIC or index linked GIC would fit best into the equity category. There are some other assets that can be problematic here. Some stuff is obvious. I would suggest it would be hard to find a circumstance where a treasury bill would fit anywhere other than in the cash asset class. Ditto for a checking account. Savings accounts, probably the same thing. They probably always fit into the cash asset class. Bonds issued by public companies, by major public companies that trade on a major exchange, will almost invariably fit into the fixed income asset class. Common shares will almost invariably fit into the equity asset class. That's fine. But we do have some other assets where this might be a little bit less decisive. Real estate is a good example. Real estate sometimes will fill a fixed income type of role in an investor's portfolio. And I would suggest this would be true where you have maybe enough of a real estate portfolio that there's a nice steady stream of fixed income coming from that. And you're not overly concerned about volatility. That is the values of that real estate aren't fluctuating significantly one way or the other. And really the goal for that investor with that real estate is just to provide ongoing income. And that ongoing income does have some fairly reliable characteristics to it. Maybe you have some long-term leases there, or maybe just a very stable group of tenants. Uh, maybe you have enough of a diversified portfolio that you're not tied all to one economy or one underlying resource that might justify putting real estate into the fixed income asset class. Whereas if your real estate is primarily purchased for the purpose of generating capital gains and you're intending to sell it one day at an appreciated value, and it's not so much about the income, rather you're, you're really just using the income to cover the cost of ownership, then that real estate probably fits better into the equity asset class. Again, up to the advisor or planner to figure that out based on their discussions with the client. Uh, preferred shares. Preferred shares generally are categorized in the fixed income asset class, but there are circumstances where a preferred share issuer might create some volatility here. It might be um, in a very volatile time as we had in 2008 when preferred shares often were trading based on the uh, supply and demand for the common shares for the preferred share issuer when there was just question about the ongoing ability of those issuers to uh, conduct business. Or it might be that the preferred share is related to a smaller company 
maybe an issuer that's not on a public exchange or not on a major public exchange. And much the same with debentures and bonds, that with debentures and bonds, when they come from a big publicly traded firm, then they probably look more like fixed income. But as that firm gets to be less like a big publicly traded company, whether it trades on a private ex or on a uh, venture exchange or whether it's just sold on a private issue, a private placement basis, that type of um, that type of investment, then you may find that it fits better in the equity class. And you'll often find those riskier debentures and bonds do trade more like equity. They may be uh, somewhat illiquid. They may have prices that are highly dependent on the quality and the perceived quality supply and demand that is for the underlying issuer. I hope this helps. I hope that you're able to apply this to whatever asset allocation model you work in and hope you can turn this into something useful in terms of helping your clients to arrive at better outcomes. Thank you very much and have a great day. Enjoy your continued studies.